Hello, we're going to talk about chapter three, health, illness, and disparities. We're gonna pause here on this slide for just a few seconds. And I'm hoping you've got something to write on and a piece of paper, because I want you to try to think about how do you define health? So think about that for a minute. Some of you might be thinking, well, health is when someone is in good physical health. They don't have any signs or symptoms of disease. They are able to perform their tasks, such as going to work, being able to bathe themselves, paying their bills, making enough money to do that having a support system in place. All of these things might be terms or things that you thought of that would help us to define someone healthy. But believe it or not, there are several different definitions to define health. And by the time we get to the end of this PowerPoint, you might just agree that someone can be a diabetic, but still be healthy. This is a little cartoon about what you might look like after you have done four 12-hour shifts in a row. For a moment, the primary objectives of nurse, nurses, and these are the four aims of nursing. And again, these are things that you need to convert to memory and know and be able to recognize them if you see an exam question on them. So first of all, promoting health, that's one of our aims, preventing illness, restoring health, or facilitating coping with an illness, disability, or death. Let's review a couple of definitions that we had on a previous chapter. Health is more than just an absence of illness. So this is really telling us that a person could kind of have an illness, but still be healthy because health is an active process in which individuals move towards their potential. So health is more than just not having a chronic illness. It's an active process where we move towards our maximum potential. So if someone has, let's say, uh, they were in the military and they have a below the knee amputation. Well, are they still healthy? Well, of course they are because they can still, as a nurse, we can help facilitate coping with their illness and helping them to reach their maximum potential. So we would really consider that person healthy. What is holistic care? It is care that addresses the many dimensions that comprise the whole individual. So in order to provide holistic care, the nurse must understand and respect each person's own definition of health and responses to illness. So have you ever met someone who really has pretty much nothing wrong with them except for just maybe a couple of little minor things? Like maybe they have you know, high blood pressure, but it's controlled by medication. Maybe they have, um, oh, I don't know, um, joint pain because they have arthritis. And you may have two people with those very same chronic illnesses. And one person who focuses on their illnesses and gives, it, uh, gives, gives them as a, a excuse, pretty much, to not be able to do things. The other person, however, believes that you've got to persevere, you need to push through it, you need to be the best you that you can be while still coping and doing the things that you need to do to improve these acute illnesses. So we know from our previous chapter that health can have many different definitions. The World Health Organization their definition, because you know they're a pretty big uh, organization, 
They define health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So, this is a very holistic definition of health. We know then that yes, a person could have a disease, but if they have, if they're in a complete state of physical, mental, and social well being, then they could still be considered healthy. So it looks at health holistically instead of in the terms of just disease or not having a disease. This is the definition that is in your School of Nursing handbook. And I like to put this one in there because as a nursing organization ourselves, we have defined what we believe to be um, a, a state of health. So health, we, def we define it here at Ivy Tech School of Nursing as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Okay, so that's from the World Health Organization, right? Well, we go on to say the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic or social condition. So let's think about this again. What do you think health really means? So it's kind of like what I talked about a previous slide. Um, it's, it's free of signs and symptoms of disease and pain as much as possible. Some people think that's what it is. Um, it's being able to be active or do what you want and need to do. It's being in good spirits mostly. These ideas indicate that health is an adaptive process and can have conditions. Patients can still have conditions, but still be healthy. So health integrates all of the human dimensions. So if you think back to some other chapters that we've talked about in the physical dimensions of health, which we'll also be covering in this chapter, um, it, it's all of those dimensions of health. Um, that we need to think about the physical dimension, the spiritual dimension. Um, all of these are involved in whether or not we feel healthy. Let's think about another term, and that term is wellness. Wellness is an active state of being healthy. So this is a little different than health. Wellness is living a lifestyle that promotes good physical, mental, and emotional health. So wellness is an active state. And you can have wellness regardless of your level of health. So wellness state includes being, being and that's recognizing oneself as an individual, belonging, which is being part of a whole, becoming, which is growing and developing, and befitting, and that's making choices to help oneself for the future. So I would say that many of you that are sitting here, you have decided to change your life or better your life by getting a degree, coming into nursing, wanting to help others, and that is really a well, it can be a wellness choice for some of you. You are trying to grow and develop and make positive choices for your future, at least from a financial and occupational perspective. So let's look at another definition, and that is disease. Disease is an alteration of body function causing reduced capacities or shortened lifespan. It's more objective, it can be seen or proven. And disease has an etiology. Now it's important that you understand the definition of etiology. Etiology is the cause of the diagnosis, the cause of the disease, which acts together to bring about a diagnosis. So 
when you start clinical in a few weeks, believe it or not, it's not that far away, we're gonna start asking you to do your clinical assignments. And one of the clinical assignments has to do with understanding the pathophysiology of a disease and understanding how that is very different than the etiology of the disease. So pathophysiology is what is happening at the cellular level that causes the symptoms that we are seeing. What is going on at that very fundamental level? But etiology is what causes that disease to start in the first place. Now we're gonna talk about some de another definition, and that is the definition of illness. And we're gonna talk about that for a few slides. But first of all, illness is the response of the person to a disease. Illness can affect our level of functioning, and it can change based on a previous level of functioning. So illness can cause a change to how we are able to function. Uh, response, different for each person. So how we each respond to illness can be very different. Some people who tend to focus on the negative can respond very differently to having an illness than someone who is super positive. They decide to focus on the, the future and being the best they can be at that moment. Illness can be influenced by self-perceptions then. Terms of disease and illness are often used interchangeably. So someone can say that I have, I'm a diabetic, I have this disease of being a diabetic. Other people say, oh, I'm ill. Nurses should know that um, people may have an illness, a person may have an illness, but still, still achieve maximum functioning and quality of life. So for example, a client may have an increase in blood pressure and not feel ill or a client may feel discomfort and have no disease process at all. So a lot of that tells us that mental um, outlook can play a huge role in whether we consider ourselves ill or not. There can be a variety of causes for disease. Certainly inherited genetic defects, can lead to illness and disease, developmental defects, biological agents or toxins, physical agents such as a change in temperature, chemicals or radiation, generalized tissue responses to injury and irritation, physiologic and emotional reactions to stress can cause us to have a disease. Um, many of you know that when you start to have a lot of emotional stress, your body reacts negatively. Some people get diarrhea, they get severe headaches, they start to feel extremely depressed and unmotivated. So emotional health is also very important. Excessive or insufficient production of body secretions. Um, this can cause disease as well. Disease as well. There are a couple of classifications of illness that we need to think about, and that is acute illness versus chronic illness. And we've talked about this before, but just as a brief review, acute illness usually comes about from a rapid onset, and it's usually very self-limiting. It only lasts for a short period of time. However, acute illnesses can be life-threatening, uh, but others could be managed with medications, either prescribed or over-the-counter. Uh, an example of that would be high blood pressure. Um, an example of an acute illness that could be life-threatening would be getting an infection and becoming septic. That's acute, came on suddenly, but it could kill you. Um, if, if, a medical, if medical care is required, specific treatment with medications or surgical procedures usually can return a person with an acute illness back to normal functioning. So now let's look at chronic illness. And it is a broad term that encompasses many different physical and mental alterations in health with one or more of the following characteristics. Chronic illness can, be, can cause permanent change. Uh, 
causes or is caused by irreversible alterations in normal anatomy and physiology. So for example, once you become a diabetic, uh, a pr well, a, I should say a severe diabetic, then just changing your diet and exercise alone may not enable you to cut completely off of insulin. Uh, however, let's say if you um, are becoming a diabetic because of the significant lifestyle choices that you've made, then you might be able to get to a place where your body doesn't require as much insulin and you could recover. But once you have reached a certain place within an illness, then you usually cannot reverse it. Chronic illnesses can require special patient education for them to rehabilit rehabilitate and for them to understand how they can cope, which is, of course, one of our aims of nursing. And sometimes a chronic illness can require a long period of care or support. Uh, they usually have a slow onset as opposed to the acute onset, which is rapid. They may have periods of remission. And, re and the term remission means uh, the disease is still present, but you're not experiencing uh, symptoms at the moment. Uh, we see that a lot with uh, lupus, for example. Uh, patients can go long periods of time in remission where they feel fine, but once they have an exacerbation, which is the next term, uh, where the disease reappears or the symptoms of the disease reappears, the disease really doesn't go away, then you may have to actually be uh, put in the hospital because you may need significant treatment, medications, IVs, in order to uh, get you back into remission. So chronic illness can be a huge burden on our society. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that chronic disease and conditions such as heart disease, stroke, cancer, type 2 diabetes, obesity, arthritis, are among the most costly and dis uh, disabling and preventable of all health problems that we see today. The 2014 CDC study found that each year nearly 900,000 Americans die too early, prematurely, from the five leading causes of death. And those are heart disease, cancer, chronic lower respiratory disease, stroke, and unintentional injury. Nine, almost a million people every year. And many of these we can do something about. 20 to 40% of the deaths from each cause could have been prevented. That is significant. That is a lot of people, if we just lived a little bit better lifestyle, could have prevented death. Risk factors include, for these diseases, tobacco use, uh, which, you know, we are seeing a lot more of that among our young people because of vaping, poor diets, which we see a lot, especially in the Midwest, where one of the unhealthy, Indiana is one of the most unhealthy states um, in the United States um, for obesity. Physical inactivity is another problem, both strongly associated with obesity excessive alcohol consumption, um, uncontrolled high blood pressure, and hyperlipidemia. All of these issues can um, be changed if we would just participate in a healthier life. So why don't we? Why don't we do those things? And that's kind of what we're gonna talk about in the rest of the PowerPoint today, is why don't we make these better choices? Why is it if we're a smoker, we continue to smoke, even though we know it can cause um, COPD, uh, it can cause an early death, it can cause lung cancer. Why do we still do it? Why are we so obese? And why don't we exercise? So nurses must be involved in health promotion and illness prevention. It's one of the aims of nursing, right? We need to be involved in promoting health and preventing illness. Uh, individuals will need to adapt to the chronic illnesses that they now have, and they're going to have to learn how to live as normally as possible and maintain a positive self-concept and sense of hope. 
uh, ADLs, relationships, and self-care activities may have to be modified based on these chronic illnesses. We're gonna now talk about some illness behaviors. And this can apply to acute illness and chronic illnesses. So illness behaviors occur in very identifiable stages. And these are the ways people cope with alterations in function. And there's really no specific timetable on how long someone would be in each one of these uh, behavioral illness stages. But let's talk about them. And I want you to think about even yourself. Uh, the last time you were sick, maybe you had a cold, maybe you got the stomach virus that was going around, the GI virus. Um, I heard that that has been kind of going around recently. Um, whether or not uh, maybe one of your children, uh, one of them have been sick, they've come home and they've gotten sick from things going around school, maybe they've got strep throat or an ear infection. So what is that stage one of the illness? Well, stage one is when you begin to experience some symptoms, uh, short term and relieved by self-care. And if that's the case, then no further action is needed. Um, however, if let's say you, oh, I've got a scratchy throat, let me take a th throat lozenger, maybe it's my sinuses, maybe it's allergies, um, or I'm kind of feeling achy today, let me take some Tylenol, but it doesn't work and the symptoms continue. And if that happens, then you're gonna move on to stage two. And in stage two, this is when the person assumes the sick role and the person uh, or people focus on symptoms and bodily functions. So in stage two, uh, you may choose to do nothing. Um, you may do additional over-the-counter medications or seek out a healthcare provider for a diagnosis and treatment, treatment. And if you do go to the doctor, then your illness becomes legitimate if your healthcare provider um, diagnoses you with something and prescribes a treatment. Stage three, is assuming a dependent role. This is when the person accepts their diagnosis and follows a treatment plan. So in stage two, you went to the doctor, they diagnosed you, you got a medication, and now in stage three, you're going to accept that you now have this diagnosis and you're gonna follow the treatment plan. You may be cared for at home or in a hospital. Stage four, is achieving recovery and rehabilitation. Might begin in the hospital and conclude at home, or it could be totally at home. Effects of illness on the family can be varied. Roles may change for both the patient and the family as a whole. And remember from week one of this class, we talked that family is one of the populations that we care for. So just because an individual has an illness, and yes, we care for that individual, doesn't mean that we can ignore how that's going to affect their family. If you have someone that's always been the primary supporter financially of the family, and now they have had an, an accident, that will prevent them from providing for their family, then this is something that will affect the entire family uh, forever. So it could have lifelong alterations in the role that that person plays in the family or their overall lifestyle. Uh, frequent hospitalizations can be a result of the illness, economic problems, decreased social interactions among family members, the person, who has the illness may lose their identity because they used to be the provider and now they have to rely on others. And that may make that person very angry and hostile and agitated um, and be a very uncomfortable person to be around. So responses of the other family members then to that illness 
can also be individualized. Sometimes you'll have a family member who gets angry with the person because of what has happened. Sometimes you have another family member who will be very supportive, both physically and emotionally. And then sometimes you have those family members that really just don't have the emotional, oh, what's the word I wanna use? They just don't have the emotional strength to deal with what's going on with this family member. And they almost become detached from the family. It's really a survival technique that they use because they know their own mental health cannot tolerate um, uh, an insult such as this. Factors affecting health and illness. These four factors may influence a person's health status, health beliefs, and health practices. So there are four of them. One would be basic human needs. We must have our basic needs met or an increased risk for illness can result. And when we think about our basic human needs, we can think about Maslow's hierarchy of need. And with Maslow's, one of our basic human needs is for food and water and shelter. Well, if we're trying to get a, a diabetic to uh, eat healthy, take their insulin, uh, good hygiene. Um, how do we get them to do that when they don't even have their basic human needs met? They don't know where their next meal is coming from. They don't know where shelter is going to be from night to night to night, or they're living out and among the elements. So you have to know where your patient is at within their life to be able to help them function or cope with whatever illness that they have now. Self-concept can also affect our health. And this incorporates both how a patient feels about themselves, so their own self-esteem, and the way they perceive their physical self, their body image. So if a person doesn't necessarily feel very good about themselves, then they might make a decision to not take very good care of themselves. Could be one, one example. Third, risk factors for illness or injury. Of course, depending on how much we are at risk, that certainly can affect whether we're going to have, have some type of an accident, um, and that certainly can affect our health and illness. So risk factors include a person's chance for illness or injury, um, and there are there, there are modifiable and non-modifiable factors. So modifiable factors would be things that a person can change. We can stop smoking, we can eat healthier food, we can lose weight, we can exercise, um, and those are things that we have control over. And then there's those factors that we can't modify, non-modifiable. And, and these are things related to more like genetics or family history for. So I have a very good friend, love her to death. Um, she's 39, I think she just turned 40. Literally the health, one of the healthiest people I have ever met in my life. She runs full marathons. Uh, she's getting ready to go to London to do her, I guess there's um, six big marathons and uh, she ran uh, in Germany last year. And then London is her fifth big marathon and she's gonna go and run in it. But she, so she's like super thin, super tiny, super healthy, eats well. She's a diabetic and she's a diabetic because she's inherited this from her parent. Her mother is a diabetic. So even though she, is one of the healthiest people I know. Her A1C, which determines your overall blood glucose levels, and, and you guys are gonna uh, learn more about this uh, next semester. But basically, we want to see people under six. And she, which still is good for a diabetic, she's 6.7 or something like that, which is really good for a diabetic. 
But then you look at me and I'm going to be honest. I don't take as good a care of myself as I should. I don't always eat the things that I should. I don't exercise like I'm should, like I should, but my A1C level is 4.9. Um, so this is strictly, this is genetic. Um, she takes far better care of herself than I do, yet I have a better A1C than she does. All right, so the next slide we're gonna look at the dimensions of health and how that affects our health and illness. We talked about the dimensions of health on an earlier exam, but how does these dimensions affect our wellness? Well, many people believe that in order to be well, you must have a sense of wellness in these categories. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in another slide, but just be aware that the health dimensions would be physical, intellectual, emotional, social, spiritual, occupational, and environmental. So when we think about the physical dimension, again, this is things like genetic inheritance, your age, you can't do anything about your age, your developmental level, your race, your gender, ethnicity. Um, those are the physical dimensions that we really can't do a whole lot about. Uh, emotional dimensions is how the mind affects the body, function and responses to body conditions. We can, in fact, influence our emotional dimension by trying to do activities that helps us to de-stress. I know a lot of you at this point in the semester are feeling probably overwhelmed, uh, an immense amount of stress. So still recognizing that and taking a little bit of time to focus on you and doing activities that cause you to de-stress. The intellectual dimension, and this is cognitive abilities, your educational background, past experiences, how have you learned and grow, grew from those experiences, and how can you apply those things to future issues? Environmental dimensions. This would include things like housing, sanitation, the, client you, the climate you live in, the air pollution, the food that you have access to. You know, we hear a lot on the news now about food deserts within our own city of Indianapolis. And if people don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, then, or even canned fruits and vegetables, and we're, you know, eating a lot of fast food and French fries and things, then it, it's not gonna be healthy for us. And our water, you know, there are many countries who live people live in areas where the water is completely contaminated and or they don't have access to water at all. The socio-cultural dimension, and this is kind of our economic level. What is the lifestyle that we live? What is our family and culture like? And we're gonna talk more about culture uh, in, in the lecture when we cover that chapter, but it can also affect um, how we view ourselves as healthy or well spiritual dimension. And this is our beliefs and values that we have. And when I say spiritual, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person must believe in a higher power. There are people who do not believe in a higher power, but still consider themselves to be very spiritual. So when you look at these dimensions of health, what does it look like if someone has fulfilled that dimension? Or what does it look like when someone has a problem in that dimension of health? So we're gonna look at that with each of these for a moment. Physical, of course, you're able to carry out your daily tasks, practice positive lifestyle habits, you have good nutrition, you don't abuse drugs or alcohol or tobacco. But if you have an issue in the physical dimension, then this might be someone who is not well physically. They may have a drug or alcohol addiction. Now, these are just little short examples. It can be other things as well in this physical dimension, but I'm just giving you little short examples. 
social dimension, this is where you're able to interact successfully with people. You might show respect and tolerance for those who are different than you, those that have different opinions or beliefs about life, but you're still able to be respectful of them. Um, if you are not well in the social dimension, then you may not be well socially. You could be depressed, you could be withdrawn, you may show signs of prejudice and anger towards others. The emotional dimension, and this is the ability to manage your stress. Um, all of you are under a lot of stress right now with being in school, trying to cope with finances, with school, with family obligations. And if you're not well, if you're not emotionally well, then you're not gonna be able to handle the stress. Maybe you're someone who does not cope well with stress and you haven't learned coping mechanisms for dealing with stress, but you can learn those. You can learn coping strategies. Intellectual human dimension. And this is the ability to learn and use more information. And that's really what you guys are doing right now. I mean, you're in class, you're trying to learn, you're trying to learn this information well enough to be able to go out and care for patients, to save patients' lives. This is not just, oh, I'm gonna be a job and let me just have a secure job and make decent money. I mean, this is how you can change people's lives and how you can save people's lives. So. If someone is not healthy in the intellectual dimension, then they may not be able to process learned information. So they may just not be able to um, learn things as quickly as others. Now, there are people, there are people who learn information extremely fast. I mean, you can show it to them one time and they've got it. And then there are other people that you have to kind of think about it a while. You have to study it for a little bit. You have to work maybe a little bit harder than someone else. And I think of myself in that category. I was never a student in nursing school that I could look at something one time and I had it. No, 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 no. I had to study. I had to really, really study to get it in my long-term memory. So all of us are a little bit different in this regard spiritual dimension and this is where you have a belief in some force that provides meaning and purpose to your life and again like i said that may be a higher power it may not be but you do believe that in something that that provides some sort of meaning and purpose to what you do and this dimension also includes your moral values what do you believe to be good and evil, right and wrong, and the values that you place uh, as important? If you have children, what are those values that you're trying to instill in your children? Do we want them to be honest and always tell the truth? Um, what about when you pull into a parking lot and the child just opens the door really hard and slams it into someone else's brand new car? Do you explain to them that you know that other person has worked really hard to be able to buy this car and we must respect what other people have and not destroy it. Or um, does that not bother you at all? Um, I know it used to drive me crazy when I would have friends over to my house sometimes and I, I had a few friends whose kids were just wild and I take a lot of pride in my home and I like for my home to be very clean. I like it to be decorated well. Um, I like it to be neat and tidy. And um, I never allowed my own children to walk around my house with a cup with an open drink in it or with uh, carrying a cookie or a cracker that's crumbling all over the floor. Um, I taught my children that you eat and drink at the, at the table. Um, so when somebody would come over and they would give their, their child an open cup of water, or not water, even an open cup of juice, and here's a cookie, and there they go all through the house, spilling the Coke, crumbs of cookies, it would just drive me insane because I felt like it was disrespectful for, uh, for what I had worked so hard for. So for me, I would always teach my children when we would go to other people's homes to be respectful of other people's things. 
So this is what I'm talking about. It's not just believing in a higher power per se, it's how are you instilling and living the morals that you have and the values that you have. Um, if you are not healthy from a spiritual dimension, then you could display unethical behavior. You know, nursing is one of the most trusted professions in the world. Uh, consistently, when uh, surveys are done and asked, uh, what occupation do you trust the most? And nursing tops the list every time. In fact, most of the time we're number one um, in, that, in that list. And that's important to our profession. That's important to us. We want to be an ethical profession. We want to instill into our new nurses that are coming along in their education that we want you to continue that pattern of allowing us to be the most trusted profession. So unethical behaviors would be things like you have a patient that's supposed to be turned every two hours, but yet, uh, you didn't get much sleep today, you were tired, maybe your child was, you know, misbehaving, you got a couple hours sleep, you're tired. Well, you're just gonna document that you turned the patient every two hours, but you really didn't. That's unethical, that's wrong, not to mention it's illegal. Um, you could get your license taken away for documenting things that you did not do. But we know that from a moral perspective, this is a patient who can't turn themselves and they could get a significant skin breakdown that could be completely debilitating and ultimately cause them to go into sepsis and die. Uh, putting a Foley catheter in someone, if you decide, eh, I'm just, I don't really care to do sterile technique. Um, I didn't have time to learn all those sterile technique rules when I was in school and I still don't know what they are, but you know, whatever. Um, and yet you're, you're causing your patients to have urosepsis left and right. And they're gonna go on to, some of them die. I mean, yeah, you may not know it because you don't work in ICU and you transferred them off the unit um, or they get readmitted and go to another unit. Um, you may not ever know that you're the one that ultimately caused their death because you did not use sterile technique when you put that Foley catheter in. So our job, our profession is not about just, um, barely doing what it takes to get by. It's about making those ethical decisions and doing things in an ethical manner. Occupational dimension. And this is really balance between your work and family and leisure life. When we don't have that balance, then we could be considered a workaholic. I know that there have been some positions that I have occupied in the past where the amount of workload that was expected was so much that I got very little time at home to be with my family and to enjoy life. Um, I will tell you that's when I decided to come back into education because it is not worth the money to me to work 70 hours a week, never be able to spend the money, never be able to see my family, never be able to go and enjoy life. So for me, occupational balance is very important. And, the, and, and I'm glad that my husband feels the same way. Um, he is also in a job where he has a good balance between work, hours, and family time. So, that of course has to be your own decision, but just remember that it doesn't do you much good to have um, a lot of money that you're making if you literally have no time to spend it. Environmentally, uh, the environmental dimension I should say, is the ability to improve standard of living and quality of life, uh, both for yourself and in your community. And if you are not well environmentally, some things that you might see happen would be wasteful of resources. Uh, maybe you're a litter bug. I don't know about you, but people who litter and throw their trash out on the street drives me crazy. It is so irresponsible. It's so self-absorbed 
that you can't look at the big picture and see what damage that is doing to our community. So I very much believe that we need to instill um, this environmental dimension um, into our children. So wasteful of resources, again, that can be any number of things, of course, um, water, electricity, um, just that, that can include a, a, a vast number of things. Healthy People 2020 defines the following, health equity. This is the attainment of the highest level of health for all people. Despite the increased focus on health promotion and prevention of illness, we still have large disparities between populations that lead to different health outcomes. So we know that some populations and ethnicities within our society do not fare as well. Um, some do not seek health promotion behaviors. And why is that? Um, Healthy People 2020 is trying to get to the bottom of that. And how do we start programs, do um, commercials on television, to advertise in magazines and billboards, to get people to make better decisions about their health. Health disparity. Uh, this is a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, and environmental disadvantages. So health disparity, it's like what I said earlier about uh, living in a food desert or living in an area of the country that has excessive pollution. Well, some of you probably seen on the news about some of the situations or the situation that occurred in, in Franklin, Indiana, where they had a higher level of children getting cancer. Well, that's an environmental dimension that was adversely affected because of the environment that they lived in. Social deterrence of health. The conditions in the environment in which people live affects quality of life outcomes and risks. So this is especially common in racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, a higher rate of obesity for certain populations, a higher rate of cancer, diabetes, and AIDS in certain populations. And by the way, AIDS uh, is much more prevalent now in the heterosexual community or the straight community. Uh, we're seeing a lot more cases of AIDS than we are in the gay community now. So vulnerable, pop vulnerable populations, there are some natural national trends to focus on. And I would like for you to look in your book in tables 3-1 and 3-2. All right, so go ahead and take a second and read this question. The answer is false. A person who defines oneself as sick and self-medicates or visits a doctor is said to be in stage two of the illness behavior, and that is assuming the sick role. I love that we have such a diversity here at Ivy Tech, and I like to break up my PowerPoints with little cartoons. This one says, I'm proof that you can be young and still go to nursing school. And the other lady says, I'm proof that you can be old and still go to nursing school. So you know what, no matter what your age, we can all be nurses. We are moving now into the different models of health. And what I mean by that is we've kind of talked about health and illness and disease and the human dimensions and how we can, um, based on those human dimensions, how that can affect our health and wellness, the difference between acute and chronic illness. This part of the lecture is now going to explore why do we make the decisions that we make about our health. Models of health are just really different theorists um, have developed in an attempt to explain health and sometimes its relationship to illness or injury. Health promotion definition, and this is a behavior of an individual that is motivated by a personal desire to increase well being and health promotion. So, health promotion means 
that we want to improve our overall health. Illness prevention is a term used um, and it's in great contrast to health promotion, but illness prevention and disease prevention is behavior motivated by a desire to avoid or detect disease or to maintain functioning within contrasts, or I'm sorry, within constraints of illness and disability. So health promotion is more about wanting to be well and being as healthy as we can be, but illness, focuses, a person that focuses on illness prevention, then they're just really motivated by a desire to avoid um, disease or detect disease or maintain their current level of functioning. So health promotion and illness prevention activities are described as occurring on a primary, secondary, and tertiary level. And I want you to look at table 3-2 in your book. So here is some of the information that's from that table. And this is talking about health promotion and illness prevention activities. So again, they happen in three levels, basically a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary, which means the third level. The definition of primary would include things like focusing on promoting health and preventing the development of disease or injury. And the specific activities, nursing activities, that you would see in this primary health promotion and illness prevention level would be immunization clinics. A nurse could go and give uh, flu shots, uh, accident prevention education. So maybe you might go and give a talk about um, the risks of drunk driving. Uh, you're participating in a health fair where you're doing blood pressure screenings, family, plan family planning services, educating the public about health promotion and how to prevent illness and health risk assessments where you're you know helping with an exercise clinic or a quit smoking clinic the secondary type of prevention uh, or health promotion and prevention would be focusing on screenings for early detection of the disease with prompt diagnosis and treatment so the goal here is to identify illness reverse or reduce the severity of the disease or provide a cure and nursing activities that you would see in this level of health promotion would be encouraging screenings. Uh, for example, encouraging people to get their mammograms, to get their yearly pelvic exams, um, going in and getting prostate exams. Um, so that would be things that you would see on the, on the secondary level. So encouraging these screenings, administering medications that the patient should be on and caring for wounds. Uh, assessing children for normal growth and development would be an example of this and making sure that they're on the right track, encouraging regular medical and dental and vision examinations. Then the third level of health promotion and illness prevention would be the tertiary level. And this focuses on uh, the person after the illness diagnosis has already occurred and is treated to help rehabilitate the patient to a maximum level of functioning. So education, educating those with the chronic disease on how to prevent complications of that chronic disease, uh, physical therapy, support group referrals. Um, again, other examples might include uh, teaching a patient about how to manage their diabetes, recognizing complications of their diabetes, which would be higher low blood glucose levels, using physical therapy to prevent contractions uh, in a patient who has already had a stroke or a spinal cord injury, referring a woman to a support group after removal of a breast cancer because, or a breast because of breast cancer. So these would be all um, tertiary levels of health promotion and illness prevention. And you're probably sitting here right now thinking, well, this is stupid. Why do I even have to know this? What, what is the reason behind this? because health promotion and illness prevention is huge. It is becoming more and more important in our society and nurses play a pivotal role in this activity. Also, you're gonna be hit hard on your NCLEX exam. 
about health promotion and illness prevention behaviors. So uh, I know, for example, when you go into your last semester with us, uh, the last eight weeks, you're going to take a, a capstone course. It's your nursing caps capstone class. In this class, you are going to take, it's one of your ATI exams, you're going to take a predictor test. And this is a predictor test that shows us how likely you are, if you were to sit down right now and take your NCLEX, how likely you are to pass. I'm going to tell you that it's health promotion, understanding health promotion and illness prevention is one of our lower, lower scoring categories. So I'm spending a little bit more time on it this semester because it's so important that you understand that there are things we can do in the primary level of health promotion to try to prevent the person from getting the illness to begin with. So talking about accident prevention, educating our patients, um, doing health risk assessments. You know, another one is, uh, I don't know if your children have ever come home and said, oh, they checked my back today at school. That's a scoliosis screening. So all of these are primary things that we can do to help promote health. Again, secondary health promotion and illness prevention would be encouraging uh, screenings, uh, like our uh, yearly appointments. Um, encouraging our family members to get their mammogram, to get these tests done on a yearly basis. Colonoscopy, for example. You know, you're supposed to have a colonoscopy by the, colonoscopy by the time you're 50. And I'm going to share with you, quite honestly, I haven't had it done yet. Um, I should have had it done years ago. And my goal this year is I'm going to get it done. But Okay, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to share with you a little bit of a fear that I have. I can just see myself getting ready to, uh, or going to sleep, then doing my conscious sedation, getting ready to do my colonoscopy, and when I wake up and I look over, there's one of my former students staring at me, and they just got to see my butt. I got to tell you, it kind of freaks me out a little bit. So, um, I don't know, I just haven't had it done yet. But it's stupid, right? It's really incredibly stupid for me to not go and get this done because it can catch polyps long before they turn into colon cancer. So fear of students seeing my butt or not, I am going to go this year and get my colonoscopy. Um, and the third level of health promotion and prevention, again, is how do we help our patients deal and cope with their disability? Um, and and that's going to support groups seeking therapy if they need to, physical therapy, emotional therapy, things like that. Health belief models try to explain why people will or will not participate in disease prevention and health promotion, like cancel screenings, like me and my colonoscopy exam. If nurses understand what motivates people to change, programs then can be developed to promote healthier lifestyles. So as a nurse, it's important to understand what motivates us to either be more healthy or to ignore what we need to do. Uh, because if we can understand why people don't do some of the things that they need to do, then maybe we can do a workaround, maybe we can alleviate their fears in order to get them to make a healthier choice. So Rosenstock and Becker's model uh, the, is one of the models that, tried, that tries to help explain why we don't do the things we need to do. And this focuses on what people perceive or believe to be true about themselves in relation to their health. And the model is based on three components of individuals' perceptions of the threat of disease. So Rosenstock's model believes that there are really three things that we need to think about when we're trying to figure out why do people, you know, make the choices that they make. And that is the individual's perceptions, the modifying factors, and their likelihood of action. So we're going to talk about these for, I don't know, three or four slides. So an individual's perception. Do you perceive yourself as one of three things? Do you perceive that you are susceptible to the disease? 
Do you perceive the disease to be serious? And do you perceive that the benefits, you will have positive benefits if you act? So for example, um, and I'm not picking on smoking, but it's an easy one to look at when we look at these models. Um, uh, my oldest son is a smoker and I try to talk to him all the time about it. But so let's think about smoking. Perceived susceptibility to, disease, to the disease. Do you perceive yourself as being at risk, truly at risk for getting a disease? So family history may make the person feel more susceptible and at an increased risk, or it may make them feel less susceptible. So you always hear people say, oh my God, my 92 year old grandmother smoked until she died and she never got lung cancer. She never got COPD. We gotta die something, right? So maybe you perceive that you're not gonna get lung cancer or you're not gonna get COPD from smoking. So that could be your perceptions are unlikely. Um, what are your perceived seriousness of the disease? So the person perceives, does the person perceive it to be serious? Like for example, um, do they believe that lung cancer, that you could get lung cancer from smoking and die? I mean, they know that because we've seen commercials about it, but do they really believe that that's going to happen to them? Or do they think, oh, you know, the chances are, you know, not everybody who smokes is gonna get lung cancer. So, you know, I'm just kind of hoping I'm not the one kind of thing. So you don't really perceive that maybe you'll be the one to actually get the lung cancer. Um, and then also I hear people say, well, there's people that get lung cancer that never smoked a day in their lives. Well, that's true too, but they also may have been in a hazardous environment. They worked in a factory where they were inhaling things that was uh, detrimental to their lungs. They could have lived in a house and inhaled secondhand smoke their whole lives. I mean, we just don't know, right? Um, and then you have to look at what is the individual's uh, perception of the benefits if they act. So how, and this talks about how effective the individual believes measures will be in preventing illness. So if I quit smoking, will I still get lung cancer? Um, you know, I've, <laughs> and, and because I've been around smokers, my, my, a good portion of my life, um, I've heard these things said, and uh, I have, I have my half brother, he always says, well, you know, um, I know somebody that quit smoking and they got, they died of cancer a year later. So they probably shouldn't have quit smoking. Probably when they quit smoking, it caused them to get cancer. Well, it's rationalizing. It's, it's not really understanding how the disease works in the first place. So do they believe that their actions will in fact cause a more positive outcome? And some people just don't believe it. Some people believe that, well, you know, um, my whole family dies of heart disease, so it's not going to really matter if I exercise and, and eat right anyway. Um, it's genetic and I'm going to die. I'm going to die anyway. So I just don't think me doing anything about it is going to do any good. So, you know, when we know these things that people believe, then we are able to do directed education to help them to understand that that is, in fact, really not what research is showing. That's really not what the evidence is showing will happen. And sometimes it's just a lack of education. And by educating our patient, we can change their perceptions and we can change their beliefs. The next thing is modifying factors. Are factors that can modify, the, that can modify a person's health beliefs and perceptions about susceptibility and seriousness of illness. So what are these modifiable factors? And modifiable factors would be things like age, sex, personality, peer group pressure, knowledge about the disease, cues to action, advice, media campaigns, you know, those little reminder postcards you get in the mail that says it's time for your yearly mammogram again, um, or illness of a significant other can cause us to modify our health beliefs and perceptions about things. So we can, again, do education um, and provide support in order to get their perceptions changed. 
So let's dive a little bit deeper into these modifying factors. So demographics, for example. This is the importance of something to you could be different than to someone else. And that can be because of age, your uh, gender, or your race. For example, I am getting close to the 60 mark. And to me, I am becoming more aware that I need to start getting, doing a better job with tests that I'm having and making sure that I am going for my yearly exams, making sure that I go for my colonoscopy because my perceptions are that as I get older, I'm going to be at an increased risk of developing these illnesses. So because of my age, I'm more prone now to start doing things that are better for me and making better choices. Socio-physiologic vari variables would be things like peer pressure. So I know I'm trying to lose weight right now. I'm doing Weight Watchers and some of the other faculty in the office, we're kind of all doing Weight Watchers and we're kind of trying to be supportive of one another. So when we see one of our friends uh, starting to eat something that they shouldn't or we're all sitting and we're like oh my god we're so hungry let's go downstairs and get a hamburger and french fries we can kind of help say to one another oh come on let's don't let's go over to Panera let's get a let's get a salad so we can kind of help each other also you know don't drink and drive uh, even though the individual's motivation could be low and they might not think twice about getting behind the wheel when they've maybe had one beer too many. However, if they're with a group of friends and the friends says, hey, dude, come on, give me your keys. Let me just call you an Uber tonight or let me just drive you home and um, you can Uber back over here in the morning to get your car. Um, it's kind of that that peer pressure. Expectations of others may motivate you. So you may not find it super important to do one of these health promoting behaviors, but because your child is looking at you and saying, mom, dad, I really wish you'd quit smoking. I really don't like to smell it. I think, you know, you're not going to live as long. You might not quit for yourself, but you might quit for your child. Structural variables. This is knowledge and prior contacts with the diagnosis will increase compliant rates. So for example, a mother with a child who's had a high rate of ear infections. So they're a little bit more likely to act when they start seeing the early signs of an ear infection. However, a mother who has a child who's never had ear infections, that child's probably going to have to get more sick in order for the mother to seek health care and to take the child to the doctor. We're going to now move into cues to action. And these are what are the things that make us act to take better care of ourselves. And there are both internal and external cues to action. Internal cues or stimulus would be unpleasant symptoms. So if you feel awful, you're probably gonna to go to the doctor and see what you can do to start feeling better again. Uh, maybe medication, um, you're more likely to make a lifestyle change if you have unpleasant symptoms. My brother right now, for example, um, he is pretty overweight. Um, I mean, it, he, he's definitely very overweight. And he's also having severe back pain. Uh, he's done a lot of heavy work in his career. So he's pretty much destroyed his back and he's having severe back pain. While the doctors already told him he's not gonna do surgery on him until he loses 50 pounds. That has now motivated him to get the weight off because he's in so much pain from his back. So that would be an internal cue to action. The pain is forcing him to lose the weight in order to get surgery to get rid of the pain. External cues to action would be 
like we talked about a moment ago, reminder postcards that it's time for your yearly mammogram um, or uh, advice from others, uh, magazine articles. I just found out the other day that another one of my good friends, I asked her, I said, when have you had your mammogram? And she said, well, it was the last time that we went together. That was three or four years ago. So I chastised her. And now the next time I see her, I'm going to ask if she's made her mammogram appointment. So these are the things that can help stimulate people to action. Likelihood of action is the final reason Rosenstock believes people will either take action or they won't take action. And likelihood of action means whether or not a person perceives that the benefits of acting is greater than the barriers of acting. So benefits, preventing lung cancer by not smoking or exercising and eating a low calorie diet to lose weight. Are those benefits going to outweigh the barriers of doing them? So barriers would be things like lifestyle changes. It's inconvenient. It's too hard to watch what you eat. Oh my goodness, I don't have time to cook a healthy diet. All I've got time to do is run through the drive up and grab a burger and fries. Um, other barriers would be unpleasantness, colon rec colorectal exam or having that colonoscopy because I don't want any of my students seeing my butt. Um, so that would be a barrier. Costs could be another barrier. Uh, it costs money to have certain screenings done. And if people don't have insurance uh, or they have a very high deductible, they may not go and have treatment because they don't have the money to pay for it. So benefits, people have to believe that the benefit of doing and acting in a certain way or manner will be better and will outweigh the barriers to that behavior. So as nurses, we play a major role in helping our patients choose healthier behaviors. You can help them reduce the barriers to action by minimizing inconveniences and discomfort. So for example, another reason why someone might not change their eating habits, maybe they really don't know exactly what to eat. Um, I know I've been talking to my brother and trying to help him with losing weight. And, and I'm going to tell you, I've talked to him in the past, but he wasn't really motivated to learn. Um, he perceived that the benefits were not great enough to outweigh the barriers. Well, now that he's having severe back pain and he can't get a surgery until he loses weight, now he's beginning to believe that the benefits outweigh the barriers. So now he's kind of trying, try, finally kind of listening to me about some of the things that he can do to try to get some of this weight off. And he's more willing to try things because he's at a different place in his life. And so I'm, I'm helping him with education. I'm, I'm helping um, him to understand some of the things that he needs to do. Also, I went with him to his doctor's appointment and uh, the orthopedic surgeon um, really, really kind of blew me away. Orthopedic surgeon looked at him and just said, okay, well, I want you to lose 50 pounds. And um, after you do that, go ahead and come back and see me. And I said, well, are, are, can, are you gonna send him to a dietitian? Uh, no, we don't normally do that. Um, and I had to say, well, I really want him to go to a weight loss um, place. And I said, I know IU has a weight loss clinic. Um, insurance would pay for it. So could you write a referral for him to go to a weight loss clinic? And uh, in fact, he did. But it kind of blew me away that he wasn't going to do that until I asked for it. So the point I'm trying to make here, guys, is that you are there for the patient. You are there to advocate for the patient. And when the doctor doesn't recommend something or encourage the patient to do something, you can talk to the doctor about that and say, you know, I really think it would be a good idea if we uh, have um, dietary uh, come and talk to the patient about a healthy diet and how to manage their diabetes. I mean, of course, we can do that, too, but dietitians are specially trained in that. So advocating for your patient and trying to 
educate them to remove some of these barriers so that they will make healthier choices is vital. All right, guys, this is my favorite cartoon in the whole PowerPoint. I absolutely love it. This is when this nursing student that looks like she's half dead says, I love nursing school, but it's causing me stress, poverty, and lack of sleep. And her friend says, well, you better learn to adjust because you've only been in nursing school for one day. <laughs> I love this one. It makes me laugh all the time because it's so true. And you guys are probably feeling like this right about now, right? We're going to talk for a couple of slides about the health illness continuum. And the reason why I want to talk to you about this model is it is one that oftentimes uh, you might get a question on. Uh, on the NCLEX exam, or you might get a question um, about a patient as to where they are on the health illness continuum. So this is a very popular model of health and health promotion. So you really do need to just kind of um, remember this one, remember what it means. Um, it really kind of conceptualizes a person's level of health, and it views health as a constantly changing state. Uh, you can go from high level wellness all the way to death, which is on the opposite end of the continuum. And it illustrates that health and wellness is this very dynamic, ever changing uh, state of health. So, you know, one month you might be in good health and the next month you might be sick as a dog because you got a horrible stomach virus. Uh, GI virus, and uh, you just feel terrible. So you're no longer functioning in your day-to-day -day life. Um, it just depends. Um, so you, you can move up and down the scale as you progress in life. We basically have three more slides that I'm going to cover. And then at the end, you've got some questions and answers that you can uh, look at on your own. So I've added these few slides to this PowerPoint because it's in the new edition of the textbook. And it's kind of a, a buzz um, word right now is the change model and stages of the change model. And it's how do we get people to change? So this model is often used to help people with addictions. And some of you may choose to work in a mental health field. You may choose to work with uh, drug and alcohol dependency patients, or you may be working with these types of patients and they're on your unit because now they have pneumonia. Um, and maybe you could be a key person in helping them to understand how they can uh, better their lives. Um, it is widely used today by counselors addressing a broad range of behaviors, including injury prevention, overcoming drug and alcohol addictions, and weight loss. Um, figure 3-4 in your book illustrates this model, and I've also included it on the following slide. So briefly, I'm going to talk about this table, and then we're going to talk about each of these in a little bit more detail on the next slide. But the model of change starts with the pre-contemplation stage, so right at the very top. And this is where the person has no intentions on changing behavior. They may not even know there's a problem yet. Then it moves down to the contemplation stage. Okay, they're aware there's a problem, but with no commitment to action. Um, and they've made no commitment to change that behavior. Then you have participation, and that's intent on taking action to address the problem. The person um, is intent on kind of uh, buying in to trying to change their behavior. Action, active modification of the behavior. Maintenance, sustained change. New behavior replaces the old behavior. Then oftentimes we have a relapse. The person falls back into their old patterns of behavior. And we know this, guys, you know this. Um, many of us have known people who are alcoholics, who have drug addiction issues, who are overweight, terribly overweight. And the change model tries to help us understand how 
we 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 start we start thinking about first denying there's a problem and then ultimately trying to change but then relapse uh, occurs where you fall back into your old habits and then um, after relapse you can have an upward spiral so each time a person goes through the cycle they learn from each of their relapses and hopefully grow stronger so that the relapse is shorter or less devastating and that they get back on track faster so yes relapsing is unfortunate um, but oftentimes it is a process of the change model and we can't get to discourage when a relapse happens or completely dismiss that person from our life because we hope that with each of the relapses that they will learn and that it'll be a longer period of time before they relapse next or the relapse is super short this time it's not as bad um, so those are the things that we hope come out of out of it so again we're going to look at these five stages and talk about them uh, a little bit more so that pre-contemplation stage the the author of this uh, change model uh, believes that there are four R's uh, four reasons why we don't start to change and those are reluctance rebellion resignation and rationalizations so the reason that it's important to know that these four these are kind of the four reasons why people don't necessarily believe they have a problem um, because counselors can can then validate the lack of readiness to change and encourage self-exploration so treatment would be focused on self-exploration rather than just telling the person well you have a problem you're just you're, you need to you need to quit instead if the person doesn't come to terms with that themselves then counseling may not work it's not going to work so how do we get the person to look inside and explore what's going on with them contemplation uh, people can be very ambivalent about the need to change their behaviors so how can counselors or nurses help they can help by focusing on educating about the pros and cons of the behavior and change and clarify that the decision to change is one that only the individual can make themselves um, this is an important stage in the change in the change theory so again uh, just like in the first stage we try to get people to self-explore um, and in the second stage we try to help them focus on what are the pros of changing your behavior what are the cons of changing your behavior so that again the the person is exploring the reasons for changing determination and this is hopefully when they make that commitment to action now the decision is made to move forward and preparation ensues so counselors are most helpful in this stage by helping people make realistic plans with small steps that anticipate dis difficulties and by identifying creative strategies to address the difficulties uh, it's helpful to affirm that the individual has the ability to change their behaviors so it's like weight loss for example um, you know you can say oh well I you know I want to lose 20 pounds in a month well that's really not realistic that's really not a realistic plan so when you're not losing five pounds a week and you get on the scale and you've lost a half of a pound then you've set your got your goals so high that it's like well I might as well quit it's not going to work um, so again counselors can help people make small realistic changes and to identify that the difficult and help them identify the difficulties that are going to be ahead of them action and that is implementing the plan when someone publicly begins to implement the plan and begins to achieve success it reinforces that decision to change their behavior so a family and friends and co-workers understand that the person has decided to eat differently or stop drinking um, they start to become supporters and counselors can bolster the person's ability to change by reiterating those long-term benefits of changing and um, we as nurses family members we can help people by 
um, giving them positive reinforcement. Maintenance, relapse, and recycling. During this stage, people focus on sustaining that new behavior in a stage that can last you know, six months to five years. Counselors can be helpful by exploring strategies to support the new behaviors and by continuing to support them during their relapses. You know, and, and saying that, you know, hey, yes, I know you're disappointed that a relapse has occurred, but what can you learn from this? What about it this time was different? What did you do differently? How did you feel differently? And this can help the person focus on what did they learn from it instead of having such a defeatist um, mentality about it. They, it. It helps them to um, accept that this is also part of the learning process and that each time they do relapse, hopefully positive things can come from the relapse. Now, the next, I think I've got says, uh, eight more slides in this PowerPoint, but this slide ends the uh, voiceover portion of my PowerPoint. There's a couple of cartoons that I have, and then there are three questions over this chapter, followed by the slides that contain the answers with the rationale. So I'd encourage you to go ahead and, and look at the rest of these slides. Um, again, um, we kind of talked about, um, you know, what are the what are the definitions of health and illness and what motivates people to make healthy decisions, what motivates us to continue to make poor decisions, and how the nurse can affect change by understanding why a person is doing something that they do. Because we can intervene, we can do education, uh, and we can help them to understand the pros and cons of changing and how can we help them make a plan that'll help them to be successful.